working, this would be in, uh, let's say, 37 BC, before he became king of the Jews. Sepphoris is the urban capital of the entire Galilee. What kind of Jew was Jesus? That's a great question. Let's explore it. Uh, you know, the Jewish historian Josephus, first century, lived, he was born around 37 CE of the Common Era. Uh, he writes in his works about the three or sometimes four schools of Judaism. Uh, that's probably the best way to translate it. Uh, sometimes sex, S-E-C-T-S. So you probably know what they are. Many of your viewers will know. Pharisees and Sadducees, because that's in the New Testament. And then particularly since the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, Essenes and then Zealots. And what he says is the Zealots are really not a separate school they're very much like the Pharisees in their outlook and view of the Jewish faith, but they're more militant and actually want to overthrow Roman occupation in the first century by gathering arms and doing what we call guerrilla warfare. So the question is, where does Jesus fit in? Now, there are a number of things I want to point out as we start that question. If you read the New Testament, you would get the idea that his main opponents would be the Pharisees because they're in the villages and towns. We think they might have had a lot of influence in the hinterlands at the synagogues and local gathering places. And he seems to always fight with them and they don't like him and so forth. Uh, but we're pretty sure that the New Testament written later you know, our four Gospels and John being the most uh, extreme of this, you know, the Jews are against Jesus. But even in Mark, our earliest Gospel, you know, right away in chapter two, the Pharisees criticized Jesus for Sabbath observance. So I just want to start out with saying that the idea of having a, a dis what we call in Judaism, a halakhic dispute, it's a dispute over the Torah. How to interpret the Torah, like, how do you keep the Sabbath? That's not really a fighting kind of thing where you just want to despise the person and hate them and so forth and kill them. That comes later when Jesus goes to Jerusalem and faces the priestly and Herodian forces down in Jerusalem. From what we know of the Pharisees, some of them would have probably liked Jesus and I want to do a whole program with you on a couple of the Pharisees. We'll do this in another show uh, that definitely quoted him and were really positive about him. And Hillel, the most famous Pharisee, just a little bit before the time of Jesus, he sounds like Jesus sometimes. Years ago, there was a major conference in Jerusalem that James Charles were sponsored. It was called Hillel and Jesus. So people came and the whole idea was, you know, what were Jesus's teachings about the Torah, the law, how to keep it, and what were Hillel's? And it turns out, uh, with all the papers given, you know, 30 or 40 scholars coming together, there's a pretty good consensus that Jesus is sort of compatible with the high-end Pharisees that are being more humane, more caring for animals, more caring for individual needs. Whereas the very strict Pharisees, it would be very similar if you think in America today. Baptists, right? We talk about the Baptists. I think you came from an evangelical background. I did as well. And, you know, you can have two Baptist churches in a town, 
we back off as individuals visiting the town and go, oh, there's two Baptist churches. You knock on one door and they go, yeah, they say they're Baptist, but they're all going to hell. You go, what? They're like, they baptize, they believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, but they've got this view and that view. A lot of these things are so internalized. So we want to back off a little, take a longer view, and just ask, what, where does Jesus fit in? I'm not so convinced that he's a card-carrying member of either Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, or Zealots. But those seems to be those seem to be our main choices that we have from our, you know, first century sources. Now, I'm gonna kind of play a game with you here. Okay. I have a list here, which I'm not gonna show you. And don't answer, just listen, and all of your viewers can listen. We're going to talk about a group and see if we can identify it by name. Okay, here we go. This is a group that says, this is the time for preparing the way in the wilderness as it is written, quoting Isaiah 40, verse 3, prepare you the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Okay, one characteristic. Second, this is a group that believes that they're separating from the ungodly and raising up a special holy people within the Jewish nation as a whole. So by definition, that's sectarian, right? Mm -hmm. We're not saying all the Jews are basically the same. No, this is a group that says, no, they're not the same. People need to repent of their sins and they need to join the way, the wilderness way. Okay. Thirdly, this is a group that is looking for prophetic figures, messiahs, we often call them, anointed ones, anointed of the spirit, anointed with oil, whatever. Typically, it's Elijah the prophet figure and the Davidic Messiah. Those would be the two main, a priest and a king. We see that in the Gospels when people say, uh, Jesus once quizzes the disciples, who do people say that I am? Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. These are these figures they were expecting. And they asked John the Baptist in the New Testament also, who, who are you? You know, and they literally go down the list. They go, are you the Christ? That'd be the Davidic, the king guy. Which, no, not that guy. Uh, are you like one of the prophets? You know, what are you? Are you Elijah? They even ask him. He goes, no, no, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But the, it's a group that's messianic then. They also believe in a new covenant. Now that is dramatic. Jeremiah in the Hebrew Bible, Jeremiah 31 verse 31, talks about in the last days, one of the signs of the end times is that God will make a new covenant with Israel and Judah together. So they want to be part of this new covenant. Moses is the first covenant. It's not supersessionism, like replacing in any way the first covenant. Probably a better translation would be a renewed covenant, once again, but now calling together the faithful people of the end times. So they're very apocalyptic. They also practice mikvah, water purification rites. But this group is different. This group believes that when you go down into the water, your sins are cleansed, not by the water, but the symbolism of going in the pool of water or a river. John the Baptist, for example, is in the Jordan River, that God will cleanse you from your sins because you repented. So it's a, actually the Baptists have said for years, baptism is the outward sign of an inward grace. That's a famous Baptist phrase, meaning the water doesn't do it. Same thing. Uh, this particular group I'm talking about, this mystery group. This group is very against the temple in Jerusalem. They think it's very corrupt. They even think it's a den of thieves or robbers, like a wild animals in a den dividing up the spoil. Very untasty image. That's an image from Jeremiah. This group quotes that image and applies it to the priests during the first century, during the time of Jesus, of Paul, of Hillel. And they say, we want nothing to do with that temple. That temple is uh, corrupt. 
This group also believes that when you join the group, you should give up what you have. You might even have to live family and friends. You might even have to leave your father and your mother. And you sell what you have and you put it into the common community. Okay, I gave you seven characteristics. Which group did I just describe? You want me to answer? Yeah. The Essenes. The Essenes. Yeah. In fact, but that's I only because I've studied you. <laughs> I, I have the references here. So I'd love to tell us how those references work because well, they're not from the Well, let me Testament just tell you today. something. Every one of those seven also apply to the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. So I've answered the question. Do any of these apply to Pharisees? Any of the seven? I can't think of a single one of the seven. Pharisees aren't preparing the way in the wilderness, doing the mikvah for salvation, talking about, we have no record. The Mishnah is our main uh, you know, reference for the Pharisees, even though it's written later, or the Tosefta, which is a bit earlier than the Mishnah. Nothing like this. Sadducees, are you kidding me? You know, I didn't add other details. They believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believe in eschatology. They believe in the end of time. They're apocalyptic. Let me just give you a summary with this phrase. They are an apocalyptic, wilderness, messianic, new covenant, baptizing, anti-temple, communal living group. <laughs> there you go. Also applies to the Jesus movement. Now, if zealots aren't that, like that, and Pharisees aren't like that, and Sadducees, but Essenes so-called are, that's assuming that within the Dead Sea Scrolls and Josephus' description of the Essenes, we can put those together and come up with a composite. It's not completely sound because Josephus presents them more as a philosophical sect. He's trying to please his Roman readers. But still, he does mention specific things, like they dip in water, and we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, the same kind of teaching about in the community rule and so forth. However, so it's Jesus and Essene. A lot of people have thought that, oh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, he's so similar. Let me tell you something. He couldn't be more different than this group because the core of this group is not those things. It's the interpretation of the Torah. And they are so strict Several examples are even in the Gospels. For example, if a lamb, an animal, let's say a little lamb, falls into a well, wells are, you know, deep, and it's a dry well, let's say it's not going to drown, but it's down there, breaks its leg or whatever, and it's crying and crying, and it's the Sabbath day. What, what are you supposed to do? This is in the community rule. The Dead Sea Scroll, it tells you, what can you do on the Sabbath? You cannot help that lamb out until after the end of the Sabbath. So God forbid, if it fell on the well Friday at sunset, you got, it's got 24 hours of suffering. You know, probably don't die, but, you know, after the Sabbath, you don't want to break the Sabbath. Now, this is taught by the Essene group, or let's, I prefer to say the Dead Sea Scroll group, you know, so just make it a little more neutral, but you know, whether they were Essenes. Most scholars think the, the group Josephus finally describes as the Essenes is probably the same group, but his description is more philosophical because he wants them to be like Pythagoreans or something like that. Anyway, what does Jesus say? He actually brings that up. He says, is there, he's talking to Pharisees, and he says, is there anyone here, and it's in a synagogue setting, who would not help an animal that falls into a well on the Sabbath. And he want, the answer in Greek is like, there's not anyone here who wouldn't do that, is there? So he's completely disagreeing with that. Also, there are a lot of discussions about ritual impurity. The group at Qumran, would they touch a leper, touch a leper and say, be healed? And even a Samaritan leper who is also a foreigner, would this? Absolutely not. I mean, they talk about that. There are all kinds of rituals in the temple scroll that follow the Torah exactly. Uh, leper, leprosy, by the way, it's not Hansen's disease, uh, probably in the New Testament. 
there was Hansen's disease because we found a tomb, uh, the one with the shrouded uh, individual from the first century, and he did have what's called, he had the lesions on the bone. So it did exist, but usually when it's described in the New Testament, we think it's probably like psoriasis and different kind of skin diseases. Either way, Torah strictly forbids, you know, there's all kinds of cleansing and rituals you got to do and separation and quarantine. Jesus just walks up and touches a leper and he tells the guy, go follow the law of Moses. But he doesn't go. He doesn't head down to the temple to get purified. He tells the you know, the guy who's cleansed from his leprosy. So that story, you got a lot of other stories. Talking to women, uh, having women as part of your entourage. We read in Luke chapter 8, uh, interesting little tidbit, <clears throat> could be historical. It seems unique enough to be that three of his main followers who actually supported his movement financially were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. And they were connected to the Herodian family. And one of them was the wife of Herod's chief of staff. This is Herod Antipas, not Herod the Great, up at Sepphoris in the Galilee where Jesus is from. So he's with women, a famous story where he talks to a Samaritan woman, two very bad words. Uh, so Jesus is hard to pigeonhole. He's part of a movement but the Essene Dead Sea Scroll movement is about a hundred years before the time of Jesus when it really flourishes. We can't date it exactly, but uh, I sort of go with Michael Wise, who's done a lot on uh, dating the teacher in his movement. And he comes like probably 75 BCE or something like that, maybe the death of the teacher. Then they waited 40 years thinking the end would come and then it didn't come. So by the time you get to Jesus of Nazareth in the uh, 20s and 30s, uh, maybe 30, right around 30, a little before that, uh, you know, the time is up. I mean, you know, all their expectations have failed. So it could be that he is influenced by some of these uh, general themes that I mentioned, like prepare the way in the wilderness, baptism in the River Jordan, which he undergoes as a disciple of John, I think, he joins the John movement. But I don't think his movement really fits in with the classic, let's call them the classic Essenes. So what kind of a Jew is Jesus? I, I, I think he would agree and disagree with various things in each group. But ritual purification, uh, different kind of social exchanges with people. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. That's one of his main charges in the Gospels that people don't like him for. Well, we don't picture Essenes doing that. You know, first of all, they won't even eat with other people. Jesus eats with people, unclean hands. His disciples are criticized because they didn't go through the ablutions of the hands before they eat. And he's like, you know, I don't think that really matters. Now, it's not in the Torah, by the way. This is tradition. Uh, it's, it's called minhag. It means it's oral tradition of Pharisees. And also the Qumran group had these oral traditions from their teacher. And uh, Jesus says, you know, that's, that's not really important. Uh, what goes into a person's mouth isn't what defiles or anything external. It's what comes out of the heart. So we had this, that sounds a lot like Hillel, by the way. You know, Hillel, the famous story where he talks to a Gentile. And after his opponent, Shammai, who's also a Pharisee, had run the guy off and beaten him with sticks because the poor Gentile had said, I don't have a lot of time, but could you maybe teach me the Torah while I'm standing on one foot? Now, that is hyperbole, because how long can you stand on one foot? But what he said, is, give me the Cliff Notes version, we'd say today. You know, yeah, it's a big book, 613 commands, but like, could you sum it up for me, maybe? And Shammai is very conservative. He He's so offended. He's like, I'm not going to teach you. You're not interested. Clearly, you... You know, you got to spend years learning the Torah. It comes to Hillel, Hill says, yeah, I can do it uh, 
while you stand on one foot. Picture him going, go ahead, stand on one foot. You ready? Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. The rest is commentary. Wait a minute. Did I quote Hillel or Jesus? I quoted both. Hillel said it first, though. So he's a Pharisee, kind of, or a Hillel Pharisee. But I just read all these other things that have nothing to do with Hillel isn't preparing the way in the wilderness. I have no indication that he's particularly apocalyptic. Never says anything about, oh, we're ready for the new covenant and so forth, you see. So I think when we talk about what kind of a Jew is Jesus, we can't actually pigeonhole him, but we can describe him in the light of these kind of very rich descriptions of the other group and try to see uh, where he lands. Now, there is a challenge in doing this because we're reading later accounts written uh, 70, 80, 90, even 100 CE, where people are reflecting back on the Jesus they want to remember. So one of the things we have to do is sift through the sayings of Jesus and try to see what might be reflecting more the later post-70s when the temple was destroyed. So maybe some of that might not go back to the historical Jesus. But many scholars who've worked uh, with the sayings of Jesus, my teacher, Norman Perrin at the University of Chicago, uh, John Dominic Crossan, I would name um, Dale Allison has done a lot of work on this to try to distill what the earliest body of material, Paula Fredrickson, those are the people I name as maybe doing the best work on recovering the teachings of the historical Jesus. Um, I think we got a pretty good shot at, at thinking about what he was all about. And you really can't pigeonhole him very easily into one of these schools. But I do think it's worth noting that uh, he's like almost all the groups in certain ways. Sadducees are probably a stretch because from what we know about them, and we're not even sure of all that they think, but they seem to be more Epicurean-like in the sense that they're not particularly worried about death and afterlife and so on. For your viewers, I want to note, there are two books in the Apocrypha. I hate that it's called that. This is you know, basically meaning false writings or whatever. It's not as bad as pseudepigrapha, which is really bad, you know, but Apocrypha. Uh, Roman Catholics have these books in their Bible. So if any of your people listening are Roman Catholic, they can just get out their Catholic Bible and read. But you've got the wisdom of Solomon and then a book by Jesus, but not Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus ben Sirach. So we used to call it ben Sirach and the wisdom of Solomon. Those two books preserve for us two of the ancient views in their kind of a more developed form. So when you read Ben Sirach, it's very much the old, almost Sadducean view, which is the view of Job and his friends. Not Job, but his friends. They go, look, if bad things happen to good people, it's because the good people probably have some secret sins because God is just. And in the end, it's all going to work out. And every single thing that ever happens in the universe is controlled by God. It's all perfectly just. You just can't see the mosaic. You, know, you got to back off. God has his plan. But they don't think there's afterlife, you see. And you go to the wisdom of Solomon. It sounds like Plato wrote it. I mean, it's very Jewish, but it's Platonic philosophy. The souls are immortal and wicked people say that when you die, you're extinguished like a flame. It's the very Epicurean view and your soul just dissipates in the cosmos. So Jesus wouldn't, I don't, I don't think he would identify with the Sadducees because he's very much, I think, an eschatological apocalyptic guy. I mean, I go with Schweitzer there. I go with some of the uh, Crossan and Ehrman and Allison and Friedrichson all have their differences on those things that we have to iron out. But uh, still, you know, he's different enough. He's unique enough to kind of stand out. So ask me the question again, what kind of a Jew is Jesus? Uh, 
I don't think he carried any ID card, but he probably is most identified with what I would call the prophetic vision of Micah, Amos, Hosea, 2nd Isaiah, Jeremiah. He seems to literally be immersed in these books. And many of the things that he says, I'm not talking about to fulfill prophecy like Matthew. Oh, he's born in Bethlehem. Look, nothing like that. I'm talking about deep teachings, like quoting Jeremiah and saying God never wanted sacrifice and that this is a den of robbers and things like that. He seems to be drinking in. God looks at the internal, not the external. And what about mercy, justice, and judgment? These are the main things to emphasize. He says things like that. But he also thinks the end is near. And he proposes to some people that maybe you wouldn't even get married. And that getting pregnant and having babies not, might not be the time. And I think during his time, there was such an expectation that the end was near. That it's kind of a revival of the so-called Essene Dead Sea Scroll thing in the next century, but with Jesus and John the Baptist at the head. Now, one final thing I want to say. Everybody wants John the Baptist to be strict. It, it's just this story. You see him in the movies, he's got wild hair, and he looks completely certifiably mentally ill in every movie. He always talks like this. I tell you, he you know, never did, would never have a conversation with this guy. Where is this coming from? Do you know the only teachings we have preserved of John are in the source that we call the Q source, the sayings of Jesus? But it starts with sayings of John. What does he say? Let him who has two coats share with him who has none. He who has food share with those that are hungry. Blessed are you. And he begins to talk about the blessings just the way Jesus did. So we don't have any indication that John the Baptist was this fierce, rigid guy. Some people would say he was probably at Qumran and he's very strict and there's kind of a conflict between him and Jesus on, you know, how to approach the Torah. I'm not so sure there's evidence for that. Their mothers were related, we think. Uh, you do know Jews went up to Jerusalem three times a year for the harvest festivals. Spring, Days of Unloved Bread, Passover, Summer, uh, Shavuot, which we just had recently when we're filming this, what, about a week ago, the Summer Harvest and the Fall Harvest Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Uh, John is is down in that area. We think at Ein Kerem is his traditional home just outside of Jerusalem. That's a Jerusalem suburb. People drive there for picnics on the Sabbath. You know, it's really close. It takes about 10 minutes from the center of the city to get to Ein Kerem. So who's to say that John and Jesus didn't even grow up together? They probably did. If we, we can accept the tradition that Luke preserves that Mary and Elizabeth are related. So I think John, you know, and Jesus seem to be very close. Jesus says among those born of women, there's none greater than John. So I don't think you can pigeonhole these people, but we need to put them in their time and place. That's the key. But he was a Jew. I think he was a descendant of uh, David. I know a lot of my scholarly friends doubt that. But I would go with Paul, our earliest source, that of the seed of David from the flesh, we have Jesus. Mm -hmm.